On this week's episode of the RAG podcast, I was joined by Amit Pandit. Amit is the founder of Apt Search, a specialist recruitment agency from the UK that recruit exclusively in the e-discovery space, so a very niche uh, part of the industry. Now, in, in this season's series of the RAG, I'm talking more about the human side of running a recruitment agency. So we didn't talk massively about Amit's agency and the detail of what he does. Uh, I actually decided to, to, to interview Amit after a conversation recently about uh, something he's been through over the last few years, which I, was, I, found, in, I found incredible because I didn't know it, uh, I didn't know it really existed and uh, well, I didn't know anything to do with it. So Amit was unfortunate enough to uh, contract something called Lyme's disease that you may or may not have heard of um, just before he got married a few years ago. Now, uh, what looked like a simple bite on his leg from, a, from an insect whilst training in a, in a field <laughs> outside, um, this has led to a journey of five, six years of um, discovery in both physical and mental health challenges that have almost, you know, almost taken his life. They've, they've almost taken his business, almost ruined his marriage. Um, so much has happened to this guy off the back of something so innocuous that um, I don't think many people know much about. I, I certainly didn't. So in this episode, Amit talks about how he, what, what he tells his story, what, what he did, what happened. Um, he was a year into running his agency. He's managed to keep the agency going. He's had little breaks here and there, but the business is going well. Um, and he's, you know, he's a classic recruitment owner that you know, he wants to work through it. He's still on the phone even when he's in hospital and all sorts. But it, I'm, I'm delighted to say that he's, you know, he's, he's in a really good place now and things are going well. So um, I really hope you enjoy this episode. He's a, he's a genuinely great guy, um, really down to earth. The signal was a little bit in and out at times. So apologies if the sound quality at the beginning isn't as good as you're used to. It does get better throughout the episode, but um, he's in the northeast of England and his signal wasn't amazing. Uh, I'm in Spain in Ibiza at the moment, so my signal was okay, but um, there's a bit of a storm happening right now outside. So uh, we're both coming at it from angles where the, the, you know, the, the connection wasn't great. But what, the, what we discussed was great. The content is awesome. Um, and I think you'll, you'll learn a lot about this condition, but also about how one man can deal with so much shit whilst running a recruitment company and come out positively on the other side. So if you're going through things right now, hopefully this helps. And if you, um, if you want to find out more about this, then please reach out to Amit after listening to the show. So without further ado, Amit, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks for having us on. That's all right, mate. We, uh, How are you doing? I'm well. We've just been laughing before the show about the, uh, the standard of the, uh, the Wi-Fi internet where you are. So if listeners are, are a little bit, sh- they're wondering what the delays are. It is, it's not uh, me or you being particularly slow today. It is definitely the power of Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. It's the, uh, the Wi-Fi in the northeast of England. It's, uh, it's not the best at the minute where I am. So hopefully, hopefully it's not too bad. No, we'll do our best. Be all right. We'll do our best. Amit, well, look, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I've, I've mentioned, obviously, a bit about you in the intro, but I always ask my guests to, um, to do it justice. So tell us, for the listener's benefit, who you are and what you do. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, heard my name. So Amit, um, basically founder of App Search and Selection. So we specialize in e-discovery recruitment. And uh, started off, you know, started off recruitment back in 2005 over at Computer People right. and uh, went over to, to Randstad Abraxas in 2008 and then uh, set up another company around 2009, uh, which for a few years, but decided to, to move on from there and just set up Apt, which is, is kind of uh, just solely focused on e-discovery uh, in 2012. Right. So eight years in the making. Yeah, just over eight years now. So yeah, it's been a, been an interesting journey. Uh, learned a lot along the way. Uh, you know, Has it gone working quick? in some of the bigger companies to begin with. Uh, it has and it hasn't. Like some parts of it have just gone very, very quickly. I think the start went very quick. The middle bit has gone slow. And then more recently, it started to speed up again. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's reasons behind that, which I'm sure we'll, we'll dig into. Uh, yeah, because obviously this, 
I'm doing a short season of the rag where we're talking about the human side of being a recruitment owner and the things that go on above and beyond the job and that can affect us trying to lead our businesses to, to success and growth. Um, and obviously we've been working together on the academy and things and we had a chat and um, when I heard your story, I was just, oh, I couldn't believe it really. Mm. I was like, yeah, it's crazy. And, and I wanted to, you know, to let other people know what, what, what you've been through and that, you know, there's things out there that are affecting people in a, in a crazy way. So um, tell us, because where, where, you, you mentioned to me on the phone, it, was, it all started when you were getting married. So where, take us back to the story of what actually happened to you and when it was. Yeah, sure. So, um, so as I said, I started App Search Up in 2012, and in 2013, so it was literally just you know about a year and a bit after. Well, that's when I was getting married, and um, I was actually it was November, and I was preparing. Uh, I was going to go uh, to an event. I remember I was going to an event in Prague, and I was in the northeast of England. And I decided to go to a boot camp to just sort of, you know, prepare for the wedding, sort of look as good as I could yeah, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. So I went to this boot camp and, um, you know, this guy's sort of beasting you around, telling you to do this, that and the other, doing it, getting on with it. And I felt something on my leg that day. And I, I thought I'd just kicked myself on my right. leg in this field. Uh, but it didn't feel right, and so it was kind of a bit itchy and whatnot. But anyway, got on the plane, went over to Prague. We were sponsoring a conference over there, and got over there, and then ended up going on a, a bit of a night out there with some potential clients and stuff like that. And you know, had a had a really good night out. It was good mm -hmm. fun. Next morning, um, I woke up, I got out of bed, and I just fell flat on my face. Right, so I looked down and my leg was all swollen from my knee all the way down to my ankle. And, you know, I thought I danced a bit too much last night. But um, it, was, it was obviously, it was, it was nothing to do with the night out. It was, it was that bite, you know, when I thought I'd kicked myself. So I uh, ended up going to hospital then. Uh, so they called us. A, they called us an ambulance. Went to hospital because it just was not right. The whole, the whole leg was inflamed, and you know, over there, couldn't couldn't speak the same language. But they were, you know, the doctors were all chatting about what was going on. Didn't really think about, you know, what I was was really confused about what it could be. But they gave us some gave me some antibiotics, and you know, sort of wrapped up the area which had been bitten and then sent me on my way. And then that was about 10 days worth of medication that they gave us. And it cleared it up, to be fair, it was, it was a lot better. It was pretty much gone, as in all of the swelling and everything. And I thought, okay, whatever it was, it's, it's, it's done now. So yeah, yeah. went back to the UK, and then a few, few weeks after, it started coming back again, as in like the swelling and all that sort of stuff in the leg. Went back to hospital, they gave me some more antibiotics and then, you know, sent me on my way. That didn't work. I had to get some more antibiotics and um, that did clear it up. So I thought, hopefully that's the end of it and, and that's it. But, were, you, um, were you married now at this point? Yeah. Things started. No, so this was all just before the wedding. So this was like literally about a month before the wedding. Right. And the wedding was over in, in Langkawi in Malaysia. Yeah, I know it. And went over to went over for the wedding and everything. And yeah, lovely place. And but I was starting to feel a bit weird, like a bit strange, right? I wasn't getting cold feet or anything. It was just, you know, I started sort of having these more cognitive kind of uh issues where I don't know, I was feeling a bit anxious and I started thinking to myself, that's oh, just normal. This is just potentially just because, you know, the big day's coming up and that's it. But, you know, later on, I figured out that it wasn't anything to do with that. It was just, it was that this, um, this infection, Lyme disease, uh, which we later found out it was, had uh, obviously started, you know, flying around my body and, you know, it infiltrates different parts of the body. I mean, pretty much everywhere. So it was obviously getting into my brain as well um, and causing issues there, cognitive issues. So anyway, we got married 
and um, great day, great few days as Indian weddings are. Yeah. And uh, ended up ended up coming back to the UK. My wife's from Australia, and so what happened was she actually had to go back to Australia for a short period of time. We ended up, you know, she came over to the UK in sort of January, February of 2014, and and then I developed. Um, I developed shingles, right? Which is from chicken pox. I don't know if you know about yep. shingles or not, but a little it's bit. something that a lot of people they get later on in life. Mm. Yeah, so it's from, I mean, it's kind of the, you know, when you get chicken pox, I think it, it's something which stays with you. It just goes dormant in, inside of you and it can come out later on um, as shingles. But it tends, tends to be with people that are a lot older, sort of over the age of 50. Um, you know, and I was in my sort of early 30s, basically, at you know, that time, sort of around 30, I think. So it was a bit strange. The doctor was like, this is a bit weird. You shouldn't really have this. Um, and that's when I started getting some, some sort of serious, as I said, cognitive issues and uh, depression, anxiety. All this stuff was kind of kicking in quite heavily. So it was really confusing because I thought everything was fine. As in like, you know, that bite was, was all cleared up. But it was just starting to, you know, bits and pieces of starting to occur. Did they tell like you shingles and like this, this sort of anxiety and depression? Did they tell you what the bite was? Like, did they try and explain it when you were in the hospital the first time? Like, what it could be that was leading to so many, maybe not the mental things, but the physical things. Did they give you any explanation originally? So, because that was in in the Czech Republic, they were, as I said, they were speaking, but they didn't really sort of explain what it what it exactly could be they said that you know would be if it is lyme disease which they didn't really specifically say they just said if you take this medication um you should be fine uh but the situation was that they which is what i found out was that they underdosed me and so you've got this window with lyme disease which is i think is about two weeks um two or three weeks where you basically need to get doxycycline uh which is an antibiotic you need to have two weeks worth of it um, and I got 10 days, I think it was, seven to 10 days I got. So I was literally just a few days from it actually being clear, cleared up. But they must, it must not have gotten, you know, gotten rid of all of it. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess at that point I had a bit of an idea that potentially it could be something to do with, you know, that bite and the Lyme disease sort of piece. So funnily enough, though, it's a weird one, but my sister-in-law actually had Lyme disease before like many years back right she'd gotten bitten in new york when she was over in the states for a bit and she'd had it so she actually was the one that kind of said listen i think you know i think what's going on with the shingles and like you know the, the sort of the cognitive stuff that you're talking about it could be like lyme disease you should get it checked out you should look into it um but but yeah just going back to, to obviously what was going going on then sort of post getting married yeah uh yeah that was that was bad because i guess you know my wife had literally just left all her friends and family in australia come over to the uk and you know living living together sort of newly married and, and then all this stuff started kicking off where you know i was i was not wanting to sort of go out and, and sort of do the stuff that we usually would do with various kind of social people and going out to you know bars restaurants seeing friends and whatnot um, so that started having a bit of a, an impact on on the relationship as well, pretty pretty swiftly. Um, so that was that was tough going, um, and and yeah, I mean it was uh, you know it was it was only a year into the business as well, right? So it was kind of things were things were going well with with work and everything, um, and and then you know I just didn't really know what was what was going on or how to handle that, like speaking to people on the phone, going to meetings, you know, with, with large groups of people started becoming something which I was, I was dreading. Like I was really scared of going to, but also, you know, there was more and more symptoms creeping in, right? As time was going on, I was getting major fatigue, joint pain, constantly had headaches. I was getting uh, confusion, right? So I was just like constantly getting confused about what was going on, sometimes where I was, um, how wow. to get to places. I couldn't figure out how to get this. And, you know, there was one point I remember where I was coming back from work one day and 
I don't know what happened on that particular occasion, but I couldn't actually make it back home. Like it felt like all that, all the energy and use of my limbs had just completely gone. I just had to sit down on the side of the road and, you know, I rang my wife and thankfully I wasn't too far away from home, but she came and sort of got us and, and, you know, kind of, you know, managed to limp back home, basically, you know, sort of holding on to her. Um, so there was all sorts of crazy stuff going on and yeah, yeah. It was full on. It was full on. It was super had you scary. Been, it was had you been on. diagnosed at this point? Yeah, you know, it was hard. It was hard on myself. But... No, so I hadn't been diagnosed at that particular point. Now, um, I started because I mentioned to you about, you know, having a bit of insight into it through my sister-in-law. She put me in touch with a doctor in America, in California. So I ended up speaking to that doctor over Skype. He was like, look, you know, I don't even need to do a test on you. I can tell you right now with all the symptoms that you've got. It's hundred percent. You've had the bite, you know, you've, you've kind of, you showed, cause I had taken pictures of all of that stuff. He was like, yeah, you've got the bite. You've had all these symptoms which are evolving. You've hundred percent got Lyme disease, but it just depends on, you know, what else you might have because Lyme disease is one thing, right? But it comes, it can sometimes come along with other things. So, um, I had, uh, co-infections. I had two other co-infections. So I had Lyme disease, Bartonella and Babesia. So I had three infections from this one bite um, that, that, what was it uh, that bit figured out that, that I had. So it was a tick. I got bitten by a tick, basically. And, um, you know, it's uh, the, the infected ticks, they tend to come from, uh, they, they tend to come from deers. So that, that area that I was doing that training, there were, it's known that there's deers around there and stuff. And so anywhere which has got deers is kind of a bit of a, danger zone when it comes to Lyme disease. So like Richmond Park is a hot spot for it. But yeah. You know, in London. And um, you know, it is it is everywhere. You know, you wouldn't think it. You wouldn't think that it's in like major cities and stuff. You might just think it's out in rural places, but it's honestly up and down the country, you know, and and across across the globe. I'm interrupting this podcast to give you another update from our sponsor Audro. The team at Audro have launched another feature in summer 2020, and it's going to be a game changer. This is going to massively change the way the recruitment agency market operates globally for the future. They've called it Audro Producer. This platform sits alongside the company's award-winning video interview opportunity um, and gives you, the recruiter, the ability to create engaging, eye-catching video content ready to share in a matter of minutes. So you can record or upload a video um, and then you can add banners, overlays, images, subtitles, logos, so that you can create these eye-catching videos that are built for LinkedIn. So whether you're interviewing, whether you're doing sales messaging, or you're just trying to put out valuable content on, online, then Odro is no longer just a video interview platform. It's also a content creation platform for recruiters. Get in touch with Odro today to see how you can implement this into your recruitment agency ASAP. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. So, so yeah, I end up speaking to this doctor in America and uh, I thought to myself, you know what, I can, uh, I, can t- I can kind of fight this off in a way. I, I started thinking, you know, I can beat this without, you know, without too much interference. So I had, I had, some, uh, I had some herbal stuff which was sent, which I managed to get some drops, but were very powerful drops. Um, that, that they gave me, but they they made you feel worse, right? So it's kind of attacking this infection, but it has this um, die-off effect, um, and it causes a thing called a Herxheimer reaction, right? As people call it, a Herx. Now, this Herxheimer reaction is basically like you um, getting toxic, like toxicity being released into your bloodstream. Right. Like it's killing. The infections and the bacteria but it's releasing all of this stuff which makes you feel terrible yeah so you know they're saying yeah you feel terrible right now but we're going to make you feel even more terrible but that's a good thing right so that's kind of how they position it and you're like this doesn't this doesn't sound great but no. you know i've got no other options here because in the uk i guess it's uh, especially at that particular time uh, you know, the, the sort of going to the GP and having a conversation about it there. They didn't really know too much about it and wouldn't know what to do um, yeah, when it came to treatment. Uh, the thing that they did say to me is that, look, you've clearly got some, you know, you've got some mental health issues going on with the anxiety and the depression. 
Um, so we'll send you off to do some, some counseling. So I did that uh, as well in the UK, but it was clear that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just that. There was a load of other yeah. things going on. Um, so anyway, I, I ended up battling through with work and just cracking on with things and just trying to plow on. Um, and to be fair, it was, it was actually a good year. Like, I don't know how I managed to, to keep going and doing it, but um, you know, I was going out for meetings, I was on the phones and, and kind of, you know, doing whatever I had to do whenever I could. But the rest of the time I'd be laid up, lying down and, um, and just trying to recover. But it was, yeah, it was tough. It was a very and that was year. what? That was the first year or two of marriage? So, yeah, so that was the first... So literally, like I say, I got bitten. So I was infected with this when I got married. Like the day that I got married, I didn't realize it, but I had Lyme disease, like literally when I was getting married. And it just progressively got worse from, from that point. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I ended up, I was, in a, I, was at a, um, I was at another conference. I used to so I'd go to this conference in New York every year in January uh, for, for work, right? So it's a specialist legal technology conference. And I was, in, I was in New York and, you know, things weren't great. And I had the number, I was in contact with this, this uh, doctor in California. And I thought, you know what, I had a good couple of days of meetings and I had about three days left there. And I thought, while I'm here, you know what, I'm going to see if I can just go and see this doctor in person. Mm -hmm. So I managed to speak to him, flew over to California, had like a day there. So it was literally a day that I could go and see him to the waiting room I remember meeting this girl in the waiting room and she was you know she was from the Netherlands she was there for the same reason she had Lyme disease and everything started having a chat with her and you know she was like how long are you here for and I said I'm flying back tomorrow just here for a day and I said how long are you, you know how long are you here for and she was like I've been here for five months and it was at that point when she said that I was like oh god this is this is serious. Like, you know, yeah. she'd moved over to live there basically for, like, for six plus months to, to do treatment. Right. Um, and that's when it hit me about how serious it was. Uh, so consequently, I you know, ended up having two more trips back to America and uh, they were a lot longer than, than a day. That was for sure. What kind so, of, what kind uh, of the treatment? next trip I had back, yeah. What, kind of, what kind of treatment does this, this doctor offer that you can't get anywhere else then? What, what strategies did he have? So the main thing that they talk about, like back then anyway, was doing antibiotics in a really uh, like a heavy dosed antibiotic regime. So, you know, the, the next trip that I had back, uh, ultimately when I went back there, uh, was to do antibiotics and I had to get a pick line fitted at the hospital first of all So I flew over to California first thing I did was go to this hospital They inserted a, a catheter basically into into your arm which goes through Towards your heart and then you know, there's a line coming out so that you can you can um, You can basically take medication in high doses um, that will get into your bloodstream very quickly so yeah, second time round when I went, when I was serious and kind of went there for about six weeks and um, I, took, uh, I took just huge amounts, like crazy amounts of antibiotics every day, um, different ones and it was horrible, man. It was, you know, it was, they, they make you feel terrible and they start, to, you know, they start causing knock on effects to the rest of your body. Like I started having problems with my liver started having major problems with my gut and they just make you feel like just so so much worse i guess different you know people everyone you know reacts differently to this sort of stuff but for me it was not good and and, and sort of started i guess also just giving me a bit of a, a downward spiral in in sort of my mental health further further downward spiral in mental health as well so what were you, know, you living in like a i remember hotel. coming back to the uk so you're living in like a hotel in in california yes yeah, so this working? is another thing i mean yeah no so the, this trip that that first trip that i had over there uh, I, I was um i was really fortunate enough actually to be connected with somebody who had um who was going to the same clinic in uh lived in california as well lived over there close to this clinic and she 
was really nice enough to say, look, I know how expensive it is and how hard it is doing all of this stuff um, on top of like, you know, having to pay all the bills for it because none of this was covered by insurance or anything. So it was all coming out of my own pocket. And mm. um, so she, so I'm yeah, very grateful they let us stay at their house, this family wow. over there. And um, that first trip, you know, was, um, it was just about going into the clinic every day and yeah, I was still working. I was still actually, you know, I was doing whatever I could from the clinic. You know, I'd be getting pumped full of antibiotics and other bits and pieces um, and then be on the phone sort of doing emails and bits and pieces at where I could. Um, it was just trying to keep it all, keep it going, really, you know. Um, I didn't want to throw the towel in with work or anything. I really just kept, kept pursuing, kept thinking I can do this. I can get through this. I can work on work and I can, I can make it through the other side. Did you have um, any staff? So, so yeah, that was, uh, say that again. Did you have any staff? Were you managing people or was it just you at the time? No. So I had, um, I had, I think at the time then I had two people that was kind of working in, in, in the office with us as well. And I mean, that was hard. I was thinking, you know, I wanted to grow, I was wanting to grow the business a little bit, but not, not anywhere, not sort of into a huge thing in any way, it was, but, but more than just myself and perhaps one other person. So, you know, I ended up coming back to the UK about six weeks later after that one, that first thing. And I, I kept the pick line in and I was, I was having to continue treatment when I got back to the UK. So mm -hmm. I'd be going to the office and, you know, I'd drive in uh, to the office. It wasn't too far away from a place in South East London. And... I'd be sat in the car and then I'd be kind of injecting myself with antibiotics in the car. And I remember there's, you know, people kind of walking, walking past, looking at me doing this, thinking that I was, you know, I was kind of doing heroin or something like in the car or whatever, but I wasn't really telling anyone in the office what was going on. I'll be like, disappear, go and do that in the car, go back in, have calls or do whatever I needed to do. Um, and just keep trying to sort of put a brave face on and just plow through it. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there was times that I'd have to go home, do, do other sort of detoxification work. I mean, there's a whole raft of things that I had to do to try and, cause, cause that's call, causing, you know, uh, as I say, putting toxins into your body and you have to, then you have to get the toxins out in all sorts of different ways. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a very, very tough couple of years that was. A final interruption to today's episode to introduce Vincere. Vincere is the all-in-one CRM ATS platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry. Now, I first heard about these guys about a year ago. The amount of prospect recruitment agencies and clients I was working with that were telling me they were moving over to Vincere, I had to look into it. And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. But the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are, are doing this to give their, their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 Crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. How did you, yeah. like, how did you mentally cope with this? Because you, honestly, I, I know what it's like having a, a new marriage. I know what it's like having a business. I know what it's like having staff. I've never ever, I don't know what it's like to be yeah. like, as ill as you were. I can only, you know, imagine what that's like. But I know the other things are fucking hard anyway. Like, <laughs> adding this 
unknown disease that's affecting every part of your body. Like, how the hell did you mentally get through this? What were you doing to keep yourself sane in the day? So I think at that particular point, I was, I was if I'm being honest, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it through. But at that point, I thought that, you know, this thing was taking over to the point where I was, I was having a, you know, one day I remember having a bit of a breakdown and, and just thinking, what's the point? What's the point in carrying on if life is like this, you know? And, you know, I was just struck. I wasn't, I wasn't enjoy. It was, nothing was enjoyable. You know, going to work was a real struggle if I could make it at all. You know, uh, home life was really tough. You know, my wife, you know, what sort of, a, sort of a marriage is that, that she's kind of coming into a new, coming over to a new, you know, a new country, a new marriage and everything and starting all of that off with a really sick, you know, frail um, husband that can't go out, can't socialize and stuff like that. So I was, it was a really bad place. I ended up, um, I ended up confiding a lot in my neighbor at the time, actually, who um, was you know, a really great friend. He was a, he's a yoga instructor, a guy called Vinod. And um, he started helping me out, actually. So I started going to see him one-on-one and started trying to uh, do some yoga with him. And it was really tough going. I mean, even now we kind of laugh about how how rubbish I was like I literally couldn't I couldn't do anything as in I was just you know I'd try and I'd try and sort of lift myself up lying down sort of with my hands really shaking and struggling like I'd lost loads of weight and muscle from my legs and things like that but he he kind of took us on walks and started talking about like the benefits of maybe doing meditation and so you know I started looking into that and I started just spending a lot of time in nature whenever I could yeah. Uh, so trying to go out on walks, I ended up getting a dog around then as well uh, to try and help with kind of just doing exercise and walking and stuff like that. Um, so that really helped. So I think, yeah, just going out, spending time uh, in nature, do, getting into yoga was really a big thing and just getting a dog. And those, I think, I think the dog saved me, if I'm being honest. <laughs> You know, I can empathize so um, much. But, yeah, yeah, all of that combined really you know. I can empathize with all those things, like in the last year, of getting a dog, of going out, being, I've been doing yoga, I've done all these things in tough times. I, I think dogs are so good for mental health. Like they just, they force you to be present because they, they are 100% present, 100%. right? They don't have any future mind planning. They just fucking live in them now. And I, I found when I got Henry, like, yeah. I was, my weekends were so much better because I was like enjoying every minute with him and watching him and doing stuff. And, you know, not just, I've spent so much less time on my phone and, um, I'm in a beefer at the moment. I've not seen him for three weeks. So I can't wait to get back to my dog in two weeks time. I can't, I, can't, I just, I'm buzzing about seeing him again. Um, but I, I can totally see what you, how they helped. So, so how did it all, like, how did it all start? So you, you we got to the point where you came back from the U S you, you're now self-medicating. Shit's like rock bottom. Yeah. How has it gone from there? Like, and how yeah. has things got better? So I think like, it was really, that was rock bottom. So that was really, really bad at that particular point. And I started thinking to myself, like, either this thing's going to beat me or I'm going to beat it. And I was kind of juggling work and trying my, trying my best to, to do work. It was probably detrimental. It was detrimental to my recovery because I was never resting properly. I was never able to let my body recover. Um, and then I decided in 2017, uh, you know, th- as I said, you know, going through tough times and everything with work, with, with relationships and things like that. I was like, enough is enough. I'm either going to nail this and, you know, just get the job done or I can carry on kind of fluctuating up and down. So I said to my wife, I was like, look, I'm going to go back to America and this time I'm not going to do any of the hardcore antibiotics and stuff like that. I'm going to try and do, you know, more natural based medication. I spoke to the doctor about it. He said, yeah, come along. Um, but also because of all the mental health stuff that was going on, I was like, I need a bit of a, an, an, another plan to this. Like it's fine just doing the physical stuff, but like mentally I wasn't quite, um, I wasn't, I wasn't in the best place. And so I'd done a lot of research into, things that can really, really help with that. And one of those things was ayahuasca. So I'd managed to get in touch, funny enough, with a shaman in Peru, um, 
via WhatsApp. So I was chatting to this shaman who sat there and sat there on WhatsApp from a friend of a friend of a friend. And, um, and he was like, yeah, okay, come over and, you know, we can go through this process as well. So I was like, right, here's the plan. I'll go to California. After California, I'll go to the jungle and then do ayahuasca and hopefully I'll blip it. So I ended up going to California, spoke to the doctor. I was like, listen, you know, we've got to nail this this time. This, you know, I've got to get this done, but we have to do this natural medication. So he ended up saying, okay, we're going to do high doses. I had to put the pick line in again. So I had it taken out, got the pick line put in again, so I could do high doses of the meds and ended up doing this thing called colloidal silver, which I'd never heard of before. Um, so that was something which I ended up doing from like 8 a.m. till about 8 p.m. every day for about a month. I'd have to sit in the clinic and do that. And that was, you know, that was, that was hard going. And I'd asked him about what are, the, what are the potential risks of this thing? And he said, the main risk is that you'll turn blue. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, that's the main risk is that you'll turn like, like you look like a Smurf and oh, that wow. you can turn blue. What's so the positive? What, what, was, what was the pro? It was, legit. Be? It was, it was, the pro was you're going to get better, basically. Like it'll, it, will, it will do its job and then it'll sort you, sort you out. But, um, but yeah, I said, look, I trust you. Let's do it. As long as it's not going to sort of affect other parts of my body again, like the other, like it did before. Um, then, then great. Let's let's give it a go soon. But the other thing is, um, you know, I'm thinking about going to. I'm going to go to the jungle to do ayahuasca as well after this. And he said, "Look, you know, we're in California." Um, he was like, "I know somebody over here. I can give you a number and hook you up with somebody that can do that that ceremony here." And I was like, "Right, okay, fair enough." Um, and he said, "But the thing is." Instead of going to do that, he said, I think we've got some treatment over here for, you know, to help with anxiety and depression, which is doing high doses of ketamine. And so he said, I think you should give that a go instead. And we've seen some, you know, big benefits of that in that. So, you know, going all the way up to, the, to Peru and everything like that would have been a big, a big thing to do. So I said, I'll give it a go if you think it's going to be worth it. And he said, I really do think you'll see some good benefits from it. So I ended up staying there, doing the silver, doing all sorts of um, uh, other, other supportive therapies as well. And then I did three sort of, of high dose um, ketamine uh, as well, ketamine infused treatments. So that was basically going into, you know, going into a K-hole ultimately for, for an hour or so um, on three occasions. And, uh, but I'll tell you something that the first, the first one didn't do the, the job. The second one didn't, but the third time that I did that, um, that was like, that was, um, that was kind of like groundbreaking stuff. Like I had this weight. I don't know if you've ever experienced, uh, you know, sort of anxiety or anything like that, but I had this really heavy weight on my chest right. uh, that wouldn't go away for months. I'd had it. And then when I did this, uh, when I did this ketamine treatment, I, when I woke up from it, like it had completely gone, you know, and it was just such a, a relief uh, after that. Right. But, so, it's, but yeah, that was that was crazy. But was it was there still physical problems at this point? Were you still dealing with swelling and pain and joint aches and weakness, or was it all starting to get better on the physical front at this point? So I had still had to carry on with some treatment after that point. But I mean, what I'd say is like, you know, we're in 2020 right now, 2017 when it was when I went to do that. It's been the last like two years, year and a half where I've really kind of gotten like a lot better. Um, there was still like issues. It's not like an overnight fix over there and doing all that sort of stuff. And you're putting a lot of stresses and strains on your body from actually doing the treatment in the first place. So it's taken a lot of time of carrying on with like doing yoga and kind of um, making sure that I'm eating right, sleeping, um, getting good rest, you know, all the things that people tell you you should do to live a good lifestyle, right? Like a healthy lifestyle. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a long journey that I've been on, but it's, it's not stopped. It hasn't finished. Um, I've still got to really like maintain all of this stuff and uh, make sure that I'm kind of just living a, you know, a clean, clean lifestyle, really. 
So what, what does the future hold for you then with, with Lyme disease? How do you keep a lid on it from now on? What's the, what do you have to do? So right now, so for the past year or so, I've just been doing, um, taking herbal treatments. So I see a herbalist in Scotland, um, take stuff, supportive stuff for that, for Lyme disease, take that every day. So I'm going to carry on with that. It's working well. My energy levels are good. Um, I was having kind of like uh, crashes. So I started going to the gym uh, late last year and doing some, you know, some more resistance training stuff, kind of moved on a bit from the yoga to trying to, trying to build up a bit more strength. But I was having crashes after that, almost like chronic, well, it was a chronic fatigue syndrome crash, crashes that I was having, um, where it would take me like a week to recover from a gym session and thankfully like now that's that doesn't happen i can go do a session i'm okay um so it's just constantly learning about you know your body uh, how i guess how you can recover from things and, and sort of i guess yeah just knowing yourself better knowing your, you know knowing your mind and knowing your body better which i've got a, a much better handle on now so i know what to eat i know what i should and shouldn't be eating or should and shouldn't be drinking when i should be going to bed and what kind of things you need to be doing to create a balanced life, which is the key. That's the key for it, you know? And, um, so, and this is not curable. Like, there's no way it'll ever go now. You're living with it forever. So if you think like, you know, when I was talking before about, about um, chicken pox and it kind yeah. of just going into hibernation, like I've got it wrapped up in the loft, yeah? And it's like wrapped away now. I've got it under control. But if I started like going out and boozing loads, and just eating junk and going to bed like really late, uh, not doing any exercise and just working nonstop all the time, it'll come out of the loft and it'll start causing havoc again. So now you've just got to follow the good practice consistently. I've got to follow the good life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like you've had like, an unbelievable ordeal off the back of something as innocuous as a bite. Like you just don't even think about it. Like you, I've been bitten in a beef there in the last, last night I woke up, I've got three bites on one leg that are itchy as hell and like mosquitoes. Right. But I'm not thinking yeah. about the next six years off the back of it. I'm thinking it's like, you know, I'll itch today and it'll be scabby tomorrow and then I'll be gone the next few days. Um, yeah. Do you sit there sometimes thinking like you're really unlucky and is it, are you angry? You like get upset about it. Nah, you know what? I think that um, it, it's weird, right? I think I've gone through this crazy journey with the whole thing, and it was really interesting. I met a lot of interesting people along the way in America, people that have had the same issues and kind of made a lot of friends off the back of that. And it's taught me so many life lessons, man. This is the thing which I kind of, in some ways, in a weird way, I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like in some ways, it's sometimes it's been a bit of a blessing, you know? Um, like it was meant to happen for one reason or another. It's taught me a lot. And, you know, I was living my life before this all happened at 100 miles an hour, right? Which a lot of people in recruitment do. You know, you're out there, you know, all the meetings kind of, you know, there's a lot of entertainment that goes on. You're going out in kind of, I remember sort of lad culture of kind of when I was at computer people and ran sad, lots of beers flowing and all that sort of stuff. I don't do that anywhere near as much now. I still have the occasional beer and stuff like that. But it's made me realize what's important in life, you know, and about getting that sort of that balance that I didn't have. I used to just work, 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 and I never used to look after myself. I didn't really used to exercise. I didn't eat right and used to probably drink too much. And now it's kind of, you know, that you can't, you can't live like that. Um, and, and yeah, so, so I like the way that I live these days. I do enjoy it. It's kind of, um, you know, I've, as I say, my marriage, thankfully, everything worked out well. And, uh, you know, we're still together. We just had a little baby boy oh, um, a few months back. And, you know, it's life is good, man. Happy now. And, um, you know, she's very happy. I'm very happy. And, and we're, you know, we've decided to, you know, off the back of everything kind of going on recently, you know, think about what it is we want in our lives and what we want to do. And, um, you know, I've chosen to to move a bit further, further away to sort of places which we enjoy sort of going for walks and, and kind of seeing the countryside and things like that. So, so life's changed a lot, man, but it's, um, it's all for the good. Do you think the ordeal you've been through helped you deal with the coronavirus pandemic and the fact that you've already dealt with so much shit recently that this was yeah. another problem to deal with? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the, definitely, 
because I spent, you know what, with lockdown and everything, I had actually spent a lot of time by myself or kind of like in a way locked away because I was just, I didn't have the energy to go out. I wasn't going out, seeing people, socializing. So for me, this whole lockdown thing is, is just, uh, it's, it's almost like I've been through it already in a way and it's not really any different. And so it has helped, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's also a bit scary because the, the fact is that I guess in a way I'm, I'm still in a high risk category. Um, you know, having a chronic illness like this means that if I was to, you know, if I was to get it, I don't know how I'd fare with it, but, um, so, so yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, there's a silver lining with it, I guess, with, with, with coming through the other, to the other side and learning a lot about, about life and yourself and, and as a what's important 100 percent, 100 percent. what how is business now so obviously you've been through so much you had a couple of people back then you wanted to grow you managed to keep it going because uh, well, you're still going so how is business today yeah so it's good I went, we went through like sort of some ups and downs so there was you know as i said when i said at the start of the call you said you know how has it gone fast and i think at the start you know, when everything was fine, it went fast. And it was, you know, it was, it was lots of fun and everything. The middle part, I guess, is the Lyme disease story. And then, you know, more recently, over the past sort of year and a half, uh, I'm feeling a lot better. We're pushing forwards with things. But at the same time, I, I guess, um, you know, I've just, I've personally just moved to the northeast of England. Um, my other colleague, he's based down in London and would move to, you know, just a remote-based sort of system. And I think now that I'm back up here, I think the the plan is to 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 look for some other people in the business and push forwards. But I didn't. What I didn't want to do, which was the mistake I'd made before, was um, was sort of you know starting to try and grow, but then not really being a hundred percent better in my health. Yeah. And that's not fair on on other people, right? So um, I just wanted to make sure that I had a prolonged period where I knew that I was solid, and then go from there. And I think that you know I'm gonna I'm gonna well, I'm basically there at that point now, so it's just about making the plans for the future. What, but, um, what do you think? Like, what, what is the future in store? What do you have in store? Like, what, do you, what do you see as the, the future of your business and yourself? So I think uh, we're going to be looking to, to grow, uh, you know, and, as in getting another one or two people on board. I want to have that sort of done by, you know, into next year. Uh, but, uh, but, flexibility is important to me and also lifestyle is important to me so you know this is another thing that i've learned through this whole process is that you know just just focusing on solely just work and and, and not having time to enjoy life and kind of you know enjoy family and whatever you're into um is something that i don't want to i don't want to head head down that that road either so i never want to have a, a, a huge business where i'm just kind of completely swallowed up by that um so you know, I'd probably be quite happy with just a handful of individuals to help push, push this forward and, you know, a good team, um, a good team within the business. So I think, uh, you know, things are good right now. I'm happy with everything, but we can always, um, you know, we can always push forward further, can't we? So, so yeah. Well, look, Amit, thank you so much for sharing that. It was, um, it was, I mean, you mentioned it briefly to me before, but I, I, I can't even still imagine what you went through really i mean it, it sounds like the uncertainty of knowing what the fuck is going on in your own body must have been something that, that you know not many people deal with because even if you get ill typically you yeah. find out you find out what that is and you have a pretty whatever it is whether it's cancer like there's a there's a there's a line of treatment that's proven that that's what you'll do and yeah. it sounds like there's an element of just mad uncertainty with with how the uk or anyone locally could help you and You've had to go on a journey to find it. So um, I'm pleased you've managed to do that. So then um, and I hope people listen because I think there's a lot of people out there that, you know, whether it's Lyme disease or something else, there's just so many things that can affect us. And I think mental health, everyone's talking about mental health. It's always been a bloody problem. It's just now we see it as an actual line of health as opposed to it just being about your physical being. Um, I think right now this, this whole season for me is about sharing our, sharing people's experience because we've all got our own demons and how we deal with it is the most important thing how do we you know how do we keep ourselves on the straight line and you've you've managed to do that 
incredibly well. If you, if, if anyone listening wanted to reach out and just ask you some questions, are you open to, to, to helping others? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, if anyone wants to chat about this or, you know, sort of mental health issues, etc., I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about it. And also if anyone wanted to find out more information about Lyme disease, uh, LymeDiseaseUK.com is a charity which um, does a lot of great work, uh, you know, spreading awareness and there's a lot of great information on there as well. We're good. All right. Well, look, Amit, thank you so much. Um, appreciate it. And let's check in again at some point in the future where and see how, how things have progressed. Hopefully uh, the growth plans will, will come to fruition. Um, guys, thank you for listening to another episode of The Rag. Um, as I said, this season is all about the human side of being a recruitment owner. We are, we've got a few more episodes like this and then I'm, I'm changing it again um, to move with, with what's going on in the market. But right now it's all about helping each other get through the things that we were all going through in the background and, and actually, you know, remembering that being a recruitment owner is only part of our life. There's so much other shit that goes on that we, we you know, we don't talk about, but it affects us on our performance. Um, if you've enjoyed today's episode, do one thing for me. Please do share this with somebody else. Um, I don't ask you to pay to listen, but I do ask you to share, get more people to learn from people like Amit and, you know, benefit uh, more and more people out there. I'll be back again next Wednesday with another story. In the meantime, you stay safe and I'll see you soon.